2,000 were American citizens. Today, I'm going to try to tell a little bit of their story. Before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, various terms have been used to refer to the Japanese American sites of wartime confinement, and the debate over terminology is still going. The National Park Service refers to them as relocation centers, and that was actually the official term used by the government from mid-1942 on. Before that, some government officials actually did refer to them as concentration camps, and that's how most Japanese American groups continue to refer to them today. Lots of people, of course, consider the term too strongly associated with the Holocaust. Over time, the term internment camp has come into widespread use, and that's the term I'm going to use today. Technically, however, that term should only apply to the camps operated by the Department of Justice and the U.S. Army, where enemy aliens arrested by the FBI, along with their families, were interned. These included diplomats, merchant seamen, and businessmen caught in the U.S. when war broke out. Also arrested and interned were leaders of Japanese, German, and Italian organizations. Uh, the somewhat fuzzy map here uh, shows the, their locations of those camps. Uh, note that there was one camp uh, which operated for several months on Ellis Island. There was also uh, another that <coughs> operated for several months at the Army's uh, Camp Upton near Yapank here in Suffolk County. These camps were separate and distinct from the camps operated by the War Relocation Authority, uh, or WRA, which is my subject today. Today, I'll also be using the term Japanese Americans to refer to both individuals born in Japan and living permanently in the U.S., known as Issei, and their U.S.-born children, known as Nisei, who are American citizens by birth. <coughs> Anti-immigrant and anti-Asian sentiment, sentiment has a long history in the U.S., and we see this reflected over the years in numerous laws and court decisions. In 1894, a U.S. District Court ruled that Japanese immigrants could not become citizens because they are not, quote, a free white person, as the Naturalization Act of 1790 requires. In 1907, Japan agreed to halt the migration of Japanese laborers in the, into the United States. Uh, this is referred to as the Gentleman's Agreement negotiated by Teddy Roosevelt. In exchange, the U.S. agreed to allow the children of Issei to attend U.S. public schools. Supporters of the 1924 Immigration Act stressed Anglo-Saxon superiority and foreigners as threats to jobs and wages. It set quotas at 2% of each nationality residing in the U.S. in 1890. Although it was aimed primarily at Jews, Italians, Slavs, and Greeks, it effectively ended all Japanese immigration to the U.S. This figure shows the age distribution of the individuals interned in 1942 in relationship to these acts. Because of these acts, almost all of those over 30 were Issei, while almost all under 30 were Nisei and American citizens. These two groups dealt with internment in very different ways. The story of the camps begins on Pearl Harbor Day. Anti-Japanese sentiment sprung up almost immediately, as evidenced by pins such as this, which appeared immediately after Pearl Harbor. A month later, the city of Los Angeles fired its Japanese American employees according to the mayor, it was for the safety of the city. You can see this quote here from the New York Times. Newspapers began calling for the internment of Japanese Americans. And they didn't do it in a very nice way. Some of it was really uh, hate speech as seen in this uh, Los Angeles Times editorial. Pretty stark. Even the very liberal New York newspaper PM published this cartoon by Dr. Seuss. It shows West Coast Japanese as a fifth column collecting explosives and quote, waiting for a signal from home.
In March, the University of California fired its 14 Japanese faculty. Also fired were 16 Italians and Germans, some of whom were refugees from fascist and Nazi oppression, who were in the, actually in the process of applying for US citizenship. In Seattle, the school system forced its Japanese American employees to resign. All but one of the clerks fired had actually attended Seattle City High Schools. All of the anti-Japanese sentiment, which did not distinguish between Issei and Nisei, resulted in President Roosevelt issuing Executive Order 9066 on February 19th. It empowered the U.S. Army to designate areas from which particular groups could be excluded. However, it did not identify who was to be excluded. Later that month, congressional hearings were called by Democrat John Tolan of California. Hundreds of witnesses were heard. On February 27th, Idaho Governor Chase Clark told the committee that Japanese would be welcome in Idaho only if they were, quote, in concentration camps under military guard. Among the witnesses was James Omura, an LA journalist and radio commentator who asked if the Gestapo had come to America. We'll see a little more extended quote. Among those speaking in favor of the removal of Japanese from the West Coast were the governor and attorney general of California. The attorney general was Earl Warren, who later went on to become chief justice of the US Supreme Court. In referring to individuals of Japanese ancestry, Warren testified that, quote, it's impossible to tell which ones are loyal. <clears throat> US Attorney General Francis Biddle and Army Deputy Chief of Staff Mark Clark opposed the removal, as did many Eastern newspapers. Surprisingly, national civil liberties groups such as the ACLU and the Japanese American Citizens League did not object, although local chapters often did. As with the ACLU, National Jewish organizations were mostly silent, including the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, and the Anti-Defamation League. However, many individual congregations did speak out. Among the few national organizations that spoke out were the National Council of Jewish Women and the NAACP. The September 1942 issue of the NAACP's magazine contained a cover story entitled Americans in concentration camps. The article noted that, quote, color seems to be the only possible reason why thousands of American citizens of Japanese ancestry are in concentration camps. Anyway, there are no Italian American or German American citizens in such camps. Eleven days after President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, General John DeWitt, who commanded the Western Defense Command and the Fourth Army, issued Proclamation No. 1, which divided the West Coast into areas from which groups of individuals could be excluded. Uh, DeWitt's mindset can be seen in this quote from a report he authored just over a year later. Hmm. Proclamation 1 created two military areas. Area 1 included the western portion of California, Oregon, Washington, and part of Arizona, while Area 2 included the rest of those states. On March 11th, General DeWitt named Colonel Carl R. Bendison as Director of the Wartime Civil Control Administration to supervise the removal of Japanese Americans under the executive order. Bendison was a lawyer who held a commission in the Washington State National Guard. Interestingly, both of his parents were Lithuanian Jewish immigrants. Bendison attended Stanford, where he denied being a Jew so he could get into a fraternity. Uh, the quote you see here uh, is even worse than it seems at first uh, when one considers the context. 
This was Bendenson's response when he was asked, what about children of mixed race in orphanages? And his response was, if they have one drop of Japanese blood, they have to go to camp. On March 18th, the War Relocation Authority was established and Milton Eisenhower, brother of Dwight Eisenhower, was named director. The WRA was the civilian agency in charge of the camps. Eisenhower resigned after just a few months. He told his successor that he had not slept since he had taken the job. One week later, using the authority given by the executive order, Exclusion Order 1 covering Bainbridge Island near Seattle, the first of 108 such orders was issued by General DeWitt. All of the exclusion orders followed a pattern. A geographic area down to specific streets and blocks was identified and all heads of Japanese American households were given just 48 hours to report to a specified location for instructions. Evacuees were advised what they could and could not take with them. This photo shows people reporting in San Francisco. The photo is by Dorothea Lang, and I'll have a lot more to say about her in just a bit. The initial step in the internment process was to have individuals detained in one of 17 so-called assembly centers, while more permanent camps could be constructed. Nine were at fairgrounds, two were at horse race tracks, two were at migrant worker camps, one was a livestock exposition hall, and one was at a mill site. One final one was at an abandoned Civilian Conservation Corps camp in Arizona. On average, 3,750 evacuees per day were being moved from their homes to assembly centers. This photo shows people lined up and awaiting buses for transport to an assembly center. Next, I'm going to show a trailer for the film Days of Waiting, which won the 1990 Academy Award for Short Documentary. The narrator is Estelle Peck Ishigo. Ishigo was white, but was married to a Nisei and accompanied him into internment at the Heart Mountain Camp in Wyoming. 450 of us gathered at the church that early May morning. We stood in groups with our bundles and baskets piled at the curb. There was no way of knowing what we might need. We were allowed 100 pounds of baggage, no more. Those with more than their allotment had to leave their things lying in the street. It was all so weird and strange. I took out my notepad and began sketching. Kindly Red Cross women brought trays of hot coffee, but nothing could quell the bitter weeping of some of the evacuees. One young girl hid her face in her hands, began to cry, and was seized with a heart attack. Her family carried her into the church and stayed with her until she died. As the internments were continuing, anti-Japanese propaganda was ramping up, as seen in the 1940 movie Little Tokyo USA, released by 20th Century Fox. Uh, it should be noted that reviewers for the Office of War Information found the movie highly problematic. One reviewer asked, did someone mention that we're presumably fighting for the preservation of the Bill of Rights? The next video I'm going to show shows Japanese Americans leaving the little Tokyo area of Los Angeles. Uh, it's newsreel footage and was actually used in the Little Tokyo USA motion picture. Uh, note especially the deserted businesses shown at the end of the clip.
This is how the movement to the assembly centers was presented in a 1943 report prepared by General DeWitt. The caption indicates that the women are about to board a trolley to the Santa Anita Racetrack Assembly Center. A newspaper quoted one couple saying that it would be the honeymoon vacation they had never had. This is Santa Anita Racetrack, just prior to its opening as an assembly center on April 6, 1942. Here you see individuals arriving uh, at Santa Anita. Unlike the DeWitt report and newspaper accounts, they really don't seem to be enjoying themselves. As the camera moves back, uh, you can see part of the reason for the anxiety. In addition to the temporary barracks, the existing stable buildings were also used for housing. This is Roy Matsumoto, who as a young bachelor was housed in one of the stables at Santa Anita. In this video, he describes what living conditions were like. Uh, you need to listen carefully because uh, he has a strong accent. The conditions were bad because they put him in a hostel because, of, because on account of my, I'm the butcher. So everybody butcher is stepping away the horse slip. And uh, then uh, horse manure on the ground and piss all over on the wall. And they used to whitewash, but the still smells, you know. And uh, I have to pick up these uh, hay for it and make, making the mattress, you know, then picking up these straws. And the more miserable, and it made me more mad, you know. But they, instead of, you know, I figured that way, a lot of people worse than me because I lost, you know, tractors and truck and farm equipment, everything. But I didn't have much. The only thing I lost was the uh, bank, you know, saving and not much. And In mid-1942, the first permanent internment camp was opened at Manzanar in California. Nine more camps were eventually opened. And you can see the distribution. Uh, somebody was asking earlier about the camps in Arkansas. Uh, interestingly, they were the only camps uh, located on private property, which the government leased. All the other camps were located on property that the government had some control over or some relationship to. Here we see people departing Santa Anita from Manzanar. Manzanar was located uh, in the Owens Valley, about 100 miles from Death Valley, which gives you some sense of what the climate was like. Uh, the original sign in the lower left and the National Park Service's reconstruction in the upper left, or in the upper left. Uh, note that the term relocation center had come into official use by the time Manzanar opened. Uh, the photo in the lower right is of a reconstructed guard, guard tower. This next video uh, is from a newsreel documenting the arrival at Manzanar. Little Tokyo deserted. Japanese settlements like this one in the shadow of Los Angeles City Hall become ghost towns, everything for sale. Evacuation ordered as the West Coast is designated a military zone. The Great Trek begins. A Jap caravan heads for the government's war relocation project in the Owen Valley. A voluntary migration. The first thousand to be resettled since the coastal area has been banned to all Japs, aliens, and native born alike. Manzana, California, a town just being born. Reception center for the new settlers. Prefabricated barracks spring up, 14 to a block, a separate apartment for every family. It's in no sense a concentration camp, but a city with its front yard in the Snow Peak Sierra Nevadas. Here eventually, 12,000 will live and work. Heading for the induction center, where registration is handled by people of their own race, since there are no guards or police. These men, mostly farmers or merchants, will work for 50 to $100 a month according to their skill. Everything supplied by Uncle Sam. Food, shelter, even bedding. Now all we hope is that Americans in Japan are treated half as well. 
Uh, that's clearly a propaganda film, and I hope you caught the reference to the voluntary migration. <laughs> uh, this is what Manzanar looked when it opened in 1942. Uh, each barracks building measured uh, 120 by 20 feet and was divided into six rooms. Uh, the WRA referred to them as apartments. Uh, Ideally, only one room was assigned per family, but that was regardless of how many members the family had. Uh, the barracks were made of plywood covered with tar paper, had no water taps, no toilets, and no cooking facilities. The smallest room designed to hold four commonly housed the family of seven. People had to share small living quarters with complete strangers. Uh, this is a quote from a 1943 War Location Authority report. Years after the camps were closed, uh, individuals reported that they put bags over their heads when they went to the bathroom so they could pretend they had some privacy. So far, we've seen a number of photographs by Dorothea Lang. In 1942, the War Relocation Authority hired Lang to document the relocation process. Uh, they really didn't know what they were hiring who they were hiring. The photo at lower right shows her at work. Apparently she was hired because she lived in California and had previously worked as a government photographer. Among the most famous of her photographs is one known today as Migrant Mother in the bottom center. That earlier work, which is widely exhibited to this day, is much more widely known than her work at the internment camps. This past February, the Museum of Art and Art opened an exhibit of her work, but it was cut short by uh, the COVID closing. The WRA imposed restrictions on what Lang could photograph. No talking with internees, no pictures of barbed wire fences or watchtowers or armed guards, no photographs of the interior of barracks in which internees lived, nothing hinting at resistance. Military police followed her everywhere. Until 2006, no one knew of her photographs of the Japanese internment, and approximately 97% of them had never been published. The reason was that they had been impounded by the army and placed in the National Archives rather than the Library of Congress with her earlier work. This is one of Lang's photos showing conditions at the Tanferan Racetrack Assembly Area where internees were housed in former stables. Uh, note the label impounded on the bottom. Uh, fortunately, uh, although many of her photographs were marked in this way, uh, they did not mark the negatives. This Lang photo of nurserymen at Manzanor sorting seeds was impounded because uh, a lattice roof cast shadows, evoking a prisoner behind bars. Lang was not the only one to photograph the, camp, photograph the camps. The director of Manzanor was Ralph Merritt. He was friends with the famous landscape photographer Ansel Adams, uh, as both were high-ranking uh, members of the Sierra Club. In 1943, Merritt invited Adams to photograph Manzanar. Adams published a quarter of these photographs in 1944 in a book entitled Born Free and Equal. The book was ill-received and copies were burned. Another photographer, Kango Takamura, was interned at Manzanar. Takamura came to the U.S. at 17 and worked as a still photographer for Paramount and RKO where he worked on films such as the original King Kong. Since cameras were largely forbidden inside the camps, Takamura documented his wartime experience at the Manzanar and Santa Fe camps through sketches and watercolors. Finally, there was Toyo Miyata uh, Miyataka, a professional photographer from Los Angeles who was at Manzanar from 1942 until 1945. During that period, he took approximately 1,500 photos. The photos on the left were actually taken by Ansel Adams. Since cameras were forbidden, how did he take his photos? Well, when he entered Manzanar, Miyatake smuggled in two camera lenses and a camera back. With the help of other attorneys, he built a camera. Of course, he was eventually caught. Manzanar director Ralph Merritt, Ansel Adams' friend, told him he could continue but a Caucasian would have to click the shutter. 
This would allow Merritt to say that no Japanese were taking pictures. The uh, photo lower center is um, his actual camera. And uh, the image on the right is actually a uh, brass sculpture of his camera that stands in front of the Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles. I'm now going to show how these photographers captured similar scenes, but with their own distinctive eye. This is Manzanora in the snow, is photographed by Adams. Uh, it's really a landscape. Uh, people are merely dots. Here's a watercolor by Takamura showing essentially the same scene, but note the drum in the foreground, which gives the image an entirely different feel. This is roughly the same view, although it's not a winter view, by Dorothy Lang. This is Ansel Adams' view of the farm workers at Manzanar. According to a government report, evacuees, as they were referred to, were employed in the mess halls, on the farms, in the hospitals, on the internal police force, in construction and road maintenance works, and in clerical and stenographic jobs. Most of those jobs paid $16 a month for a 44-hour week, a far cry from the $50 to $100 uh, a month that uh, that uh, propaganda film indicated. Uh, $16 a month came from the fact that that was what U.S. Army privates were paid, and it was felt it would be uh, unpolitic for the internees to be paid more than uh, serving military. Here's a similar view as painted by Takamura. This is another Ansel Adams photo. Uh, the men at Manzanar formed almost 100 baseball teams and the women had 14 teams. This is Dorothea Lang's perspective on a ball game. Very different. This photo is by uh, Toyo Miyatake. Never know it was an internment camp. And finally, a uh, Kango Takamura drawing. Note the caption. A guard in the watchtower became a spring baseball fan. Uh, a photograph like this wouldn't have been possible because uh, the photographers were not allowed to show either barbed wire or guard towers. This Lang photo shows people lined up to enter a mess hall. There were often multiple seatings which resulted in long lines and wait times. Here's the same scene as drawn by Takamura. There was an internee run newspaper at all the camps. Uh, at Manzanar, both Japanese and English editions were published. They covered social events, religious activities, school activities, sports, crime, accidents, payroll announcements, instructions on obtaining work leaves, classified ads, and lost and found. The newspapers were hardly a free press since they were subject to censorship by camp authorities. Children at the camps attended school once enough teachers were recruited. Students in Manzanar attended elementary, junior high, and high school. They formed clubs, attended dances, participated in sporting events. Ironically, they were taught about American freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution and recited the Pledge of Allegiance every morning at the start of the school day. This is a Takamura drawing of the 1943 high school commencement at Manzanar. This Toyo Miyatake photo shows some high school cheerleaders. Many of the photographs by Miyatake, which as I've noted were quasi-officially sanctioned by Ralph Merritt, show Manzanar in a very positive light. Such as the cheerleader photo and this photo of ladies at the beauty parlor. However, not all of his photos showed thing in, things in such a positive manner. This is a now famous photo, three boys behind barbed wire, also by Miyatake. 
shows three boys appearing to gaze out of the camp through a barbed wire fence with a guard tower visible in the distance. It was a picture that neither Adams nor Lang could have taken, since as I've noted, they're not allowed to show barbed wire or guard towers in their photos. Miyataki had in fact directed the boys to stand outside the barbed wire fence while he shot the picture from inside the prison. This allowed him to include the view of the guard tower. These are the same three boys in 2016 on a return visit to Manzanar. Manzanar was dedicated a National Historic Site in 1992 and it's the most intensively studied of all the internment camps and was the first internment camp at which archaeological investigations were undertaken. And that's one of the reasons I've been concentrating and will concentrate on Manzanar today. This is the National Park Service reconstructed barracks exhibit at Manzanar. Uh, former attorneys have commented that this reconstruction doesn't have the gaps in the floorboards which allowed dust to billow in during the frequent windstorms. This is how a 1943 report by General DeWitt depicted a typical barracks apartment in the camp at Amache, Colorado. This is how uh, photographer Toyo Miyataki, and, this is Toyo Miyataki and his family in the Manzanar uh, barracks. The photo was in fact by Ansel Adams. This is how Dorothea Lang saw accommodations at Manzanar. Uh, in the upper left, you can see what is typically left of the laundry and bathroom facilities at Manzanar. The other photos are of uh, the National Park Service's reconstruction. Interestingly, this is one of the most uh, popular exhibits at Manzanar for the more than 100,000 visitors a year. Why do archaeology at internment camps? Well, since the residents were confined because of their ethnic background, archaeology can help identify how they showed their ethnicity. Archaeology can help reveal undocumented evidence of resistance, and it can help confirm or contradict prior interpretations based only on written records and oral histories. Archaeological investigations at the internally constructed ornamental gardens of the camps has attempted to address these questions. Uh, the gardens are one of the most uh, widely written about aspects of the camps, and you'll see why in just a minute. Men and women at the camps built the gardens between rows of barracks outside of mess halls and along the fire breaks as a way to improve living conditions, add beauty and hope to the desolate landscape. The first such garden began on April 19, 1942, less than a month after Manzanar opened. It was the design of a Southern California landscaper, William Katsuki. By October 42, there were so many gardens throughout Manzanar that the free press held a garden contest, which is believed to have spurred even more gardens. Why did the internees construct the gardens? Well, for some, it was to maintain a connection with Japanese culture. They created and helped maintain a sense of community. They allowed internees to express their cultural identity. And for some, they were a show of resistance. The number of gardens is really not surprising, given that so many of the internees had been gardeners before their internment. At Manzan are more than 800 internees, 20% of the male population had been employed as gardeners before their interment. This is a map of a garden outside a mess hall based on the results of archeological investigations. Small hills, rock and mortar features are all identified. The location of the garden between a mess hall and a barracks uh, shown at the lower right. Uh, many of the gardens were placed near the mess halls, and this was so that they could be appreciated while people were online waiting to get in. This is a Kango Takamura drawing showing a similar garden that has appeared in 1943. This is Ansel Adams' photo of the largest garden at Manzanar, originally known as Pleasure Park. It was renamed Merritt Park after the camp director. 
The garden was constructed by Kuchiro Nishi. Nishi had been detained by the FBI and imprisoned at Fort Missoula in Montana, one of the Department of Justice camps, at the end of 1941. He was reunited with his family at Manzanar in June 42. He worked on the garden with a crew of volunteers for 10 months. This image is from a home video uh, taken by Ralph Merritt. That's Kuchiro Nishi standing next to the dedication monument erected in 1942, and a view of the monument as it exists today as it left. Here are two views of the pavilion at Pleasure Park as it appeared in 1943. Color view is from Merritt's uh, home movie. Uh, the photo on the left, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that looks staged. The scale and the extent of the park can be seen on this map based on the results of archaeological excavations. The vertical and horizontal lines on the right are where uh, rows of rose bushes were planted. The entire garden covered well over an acre. And uh, lower center, think there's still people alive. you can see the uh, pavilion shown in the earlier photos. Here we see Nishi standing in front of some of the roses in the garden. And here's another view of the garden and why it was originally called Pleasure Park. And this is from uh, Merritt's home video. This is Merritt Park as it appears today after reconstruction by the Park Service. It's clearly hard to get a sense of the original beauty as uh, seen in Merritt's home videos since most of the plantings and vegetation no longer exist. This figure gives a sense of the range of different garden designs at just five of the approximately 100 gardens at Manzanar. Each of these gardens is based on archaeological, each of these designs is based on archaeological excavations. This is what the Block 9 Mess Hall Garden looked like before its excavation and 2007 restoration. Here we see archaeologists and volunteers working on the excavation and stabilization of that same garden. This is the final plan of the garden as reconstructed by archaeologists. And this is what the garden looks like today. How did the garden symbolize resistance? Well, first off, the use of government land without sanction was the initial act of resistance. The acts of garden building offered required subversive and illegal activities. For example, the pilfering of concrete from irrigation projects. The design and forms of the garden helped to redefine Japanese traditions and resisted the government's Americanization agenda for the Issei. And finally, they were often used as staging grounds for political acts, as we'll see. Another area where archaeology has contributed is the study of foodways at the camps. In traditional Japanese culture, mealtime is a time to spend with family. It's an institution around which the life of the family as a unit is centered, where children eat and drink their parents' love. Meals also symbolize the meals earned by the father and prepared by the mother. Mealtimes in Japanese American families were rather formal affairs. Expressions of gratitude formed a central part in eating. Bowing and reiterating certain phrases reconfirmed and strengthened the authority of the parents, imbuing the children with respect and serving as a language that held families together. This Dorothea Lang photo shows what most mealtimes were like in the camps. In the camp, the structure of mealtimes was completely disrupted by being public. Mess walls removed the parents' ability to pass on Japanese traditions to their children because it, quote, took mealtimes out of the home and allowed children to eat with their friends rather than their parents. Private conversations once had over meals were impossible, causing children to challenge parental authority.
This is the National Park Service reconstruction of a mess hall at Manzanar. Internees were forced to eat three scheduled meals per day in mess halls like this. Seating was unassigned and approximately 250 people were fed at a time in each mess hall. Jean Wakatsuki Houston, in her famous memoir, Farewell to Manzanar, described her first meal in the mess hall. Quote, it was canned Vienna sausage, hand string beans, steamed rice that had been cooked too long, and on top of the rice, a serving of canned apricots. These mess hall views are by Takamura in the upper left, Ansel Adams, and Estella Shigo. As noted, meals were planned to cost an average of 45 cents per person today. Uh, initially, uh, the choice of food on the menu was a source of constant complaints. The Nisei were used to more a standard American diet, while most Issei preferred native Japanese dishes. Inexpensive foods such as hot dogs, dried fish, pancakes, macaroni, and pickled vegetables were served often. Eventually, at all the camps, government farmlands were worked by internees to produce vegetables, poultry, eggs, and pork needed in the mess halls. However, everyone was subject to the same wartime food restrictions uh, and rationing as all other residents of the U.S. This photo by Miyatake shows internees making moche, which is a type of rice cake for a New Year's celebration. This is a mochi pounder excavated by archeologists at the site of block 8F in Manzanar. In the upper left, you can see some of the standard US Army dinnerware used at Manzanar. A lot of this, including pieces of the almost 20,000 gravy boats sent to the camps was found by archeologists. The government dinnerware was a far cry from the Japanese manufactured porcelain, which most internees had used prior to imprisonment. Archeology has confirmed that although internees were limited in what they could bring with them, many did bring their Japanese made tableware. These would have been prized items since they couldn't be replaced during the war. These photos show some of the tableware artifacts recovered by University of Denver archaeologists at the internment camp at Amachi, Colorado. Uh, those in the lower left uh, were recovered by National Park Service archaeologists at Manzanar. In barracks, cooking was prohibited. However, internees still managed to prepare tea and rice dishes using heating stoves and serve the food on tableware they had brought with them. This is the top portion of a porcelain sake decanter found at Manzanar. This is a homemade vegetable grater found at Amache. It may have been used to prepare vegetables for more traditional Japanese meals prepared in the barracks. This is a complete sake jug recovered at Amache. Internees would take leftover rice from the mess halls, dig a hole in the dirt under the barracks, bury the rice in a pot, and let it ferment. These photos show a more elaborate sake brewing facility and caches of homemade uh, sake found by guards at the Thule Lake camp. Thule Lake in California was the camp where so-called troublemakers were sent. Archaeological surveys outside the main camp at Manzanar have identified a considerable amount of graffiti. This map shows the location of graffiti at the internally constructed reservoir at Manzanar. Some of it was meant to be secret because it was written below the waterline or under concrete pipes. And you can see some of the translations there. Uh, some of it is obviously politically neutral but that was not the case with all of it. As we see in this inscription, which translates as Banzai, the Great Japanese Empire, Manzanar Black Dragon Group Headquarters. Manzanar was officially closed in 1945, although uh, the War Relocation Authority had started uh, 
offering in, uh, internees the chance to leave beginning in late 1944. Uh, most of them uh, initially chose not to leave because they had nowhere to go. The official closing came in November 1945. As I've said, no person of Japanese ancestry living in the U.S. was ever convicted of every, ever, any serious act of espionage during the war or sabotage. Well, what happened to the internees when they left the camp? This is what many of them found when they attempted to return to their homes. These photos taken just after the 1942 exclusion order explain why families lost an estimated four to five billion dollars in property. The Dorothea Lang photo in the upper left captures the plight of the 20% of the internees who had been farmers. Under California and Washington land laws, no citizen of Japanese ancestry was allowed to own land. Instead, they leased land and used their own equipment to farm it. When these farmers were interned, they had to abandon or sell their, this equipment at great loss. When they attempted to return, they found their farms had been sold or leased to others. Former internees have a two times greater incidence of heart disease and premature death compared to non interns the monument shown here marks the cemetery at Manzanar. Almost 500 people died at Manzanar. 15 were actually buried here, but only five uh, burials remained. The rest have been reinterred by their families elsewhere. Annual pilgrimages are held here every year as they are at all of the camps. I think this is the first time in more than 20 years that the pilgrimages have been canceled uh, because of COVID. Executive Order 9066 was not formally terminated until 1976 when uh, President Ford signed a proclamation reversing it. A chance to read that quote at the top. Civil Liberties Act of 1988 granted each surviving internee about $20,000 in compensation. The act stated that government actions had been based on, quote, race, prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership, unquote, as opposed to legitimate security reasons. More than 82,000 individuals received checks, although it should be noted initially uh, only Nisei were qualified to receive awards. Nisei were not. Uh, there's a lot more to the story, and I'm just going to uh, go into a few of the uh, additional items about the camps that uh, I personally found extremely interesting. For example, there were non-Japanese interned uh, in the camps. We've seen today some of the drawings by Estelle Pekashigo, uh, and uh, the video about her, she went into confinement with her husband. Uh, Ralph Lazio, in the center photo, was a 17-year-old Mexican-American. He was so outraged when he saw his high school friends being interned that he joined them on a train taking them to Manzanar. Officials there never asked him about his ancestry. Elaine Black Yoshida uh, was a well-known union organizer uh, she was known as the Red Angel. She went into confinement with her husband. And these are just a few. There were many others. Canada also interned their ethnic Japanese under conditions that were actually considerably more harsh than those in the American camps. As the headlines from local newspapers show, things weren't always peaceful in the camps particularly at Tule Lake, where troublemakers from other camps were sent. Four internees were killed by guards at the WRA camps. The first two killings occurred at Manzanar on December 5th, 1942. That day, six masked internees attacked Fred Tayama, another internee, 
because he had publicly supported the camp administration. The Manzanar Internal Security Police arrested three men for the attack and put two of them in the Manzanar Police Station, but they took the third to the Inyo County Jail. The third Nisei had angered some Manzanar officials because he had accused them of diverting sugar and meat intended for internees to the black market. On December 6th, hundreds of Manzanar internees gathered to demand and got the return of the third Nisei to Manzanar. However, by nightfall, about 500 demonstrators started to walk toward the police station. The Manzanar director called in the military police and they formed a rank in front of the station. The MPs were armed with rifles, shotguns, submachine guns, and two heavy machine guns. They put on gas masks. An MP officer ordered the crowd to disperse. When the crowd refused to leave, tear gas and vomit gas grenades were thrown into the crowd. One eyewitness recalls an MP yelling, remember Pearl Harbor. Then some soldiers without orders opened fire. 10 internees were shot and two were killed. The third death was that of James Wakesa. He was shot and killed by a military police sentry on April 11th, 1943 at the Topaz camp in Utah for trying to leave without a pass. Investigators reported that the body was lying five feet inside the fence and in such a way that he seemingly, quote, had been facing the sentry tower and walking parallel to the fence. And the wind was from his back, making it highly improbable that he could have heard the sentry's challenge, end quote. The Army court-martial trial charged the sentry with manslaughter and then acquitted him. The fourth killing occurred at the Thule Lake Camp in Northern California on May 24, 1944. James Okamoto was driving a construction truck back and forth between the camp and a work site outside the camp. A sentry demanded that he step out of his truck and show his pass. Okamoto stepped out of the cab but refused to show his pass. The sentry then hit him on the shoulder with the butt end of his rifle and the two exchanged words. The sentry then shot Okamoto. At the court-martial trial, the sentry was acquitted of the homicide, but was fined one dollar for the cost of the bullet fired in an unauthorized use of government property. Thule Lake had a jail within a jail where Japanese Americans who said they would not serve if drafted were confined without charges. These were known as the no-no boys because they had answered no to two questions on a so-called loyalty questionnaire all male internees were required to fill out. Question 27 asked if you were willing to serve on combat duty wherever ordered. Question 28 asked if individuals would swear unqualified allegiance to the United States and forswear any form of allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. Both questions caused a great deal of concern and unrest. Citizens resented being asked to renounce loyalty to the Emperor of Japan when they'd never held loyalty to the Emperor. Japanese immigrants, the Issei, were barred from becoming US citizens on the basis of racial exclusion. So renouncing their only citizenship would make them stateless. Another little side story. The famous artist Isamu Noguchi volunteered to be interned, even though because he lived on the East Coast, he didn't have to be. He taught art courses at the Poston Camp in Arizona, and these are some of the works he created while confined. Noguchi was not happy in confinement and asked to leave after just a few weeks. Initially, his request was ignored, but he did get out a few months later. There were legal challenges to the internment by internees during the war. The most famous of these cases is that of Fred Korematsu. Born and raised in Oakland, Korematsu tried to enlist in the Navy but was denied because of his Japanese ancestry. He ignored the evacuation orders so that he could be with his fiance. He was arrested by the FBI and after spending two and a half years in jail, found guilty of violating the evacuation orders and put on five years probation. He was then taken into custody by the military police and sent to one of the Department of Justice camps. Korematsu appealed his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court. 
In December 1944, the court decided in a six to three vote to uphold the exclusion of Japanese Americans from the West Coast regions. The court's cited reason was the war with Japan and the military necessity perceived by Congress and military leaders. In the 1980s, various U.S. district courts voided the convictions because they found that the government had withheld information refuting that the incarcerations were military necessity. And circling back, the entire concept of military necessity was the brainchild of Colonel Bendison, who had originally been put in charge of the relocation by General DeWitt. In 1998, Korematsu, Yasui, and Hirabayashi were awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Clinton. The story of the internment camp still has relevance. The Korematsu case is still being cited in the Supreme Court, most recently in connection with challenges to President Trump's Muslim ban. As these newspaper uh, rep reports show, some people still don't understand the injustice of the camps. At least one lesson from the camps has had to be recently relearned. In 1939, the FBI and military intelligence pushed to relax census confidentiality rules. In 1942, the Bureau violated those rules and provided block level information on where individuals of Japanese ancestry were living. This was a big assist in locating individuals who had not reported for internment. Uh, at least one group of researchers believes that the Bureau also released so-called microdata, that is information about individuals, including names and addresses. In 2000, the director of the Census Bureau issued a public apology, noting that the Bureau was, quote, directly implicated in the denial of civil rights to U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry, end quote. Ignoring this history, in 2018, the Census Bureau announced plans to ask people on the 2020 Census if they are U.S. citizens. Immediately, there were concerns that this information could be used to identify undocumented aliens so they could be deported. However, in 2019, the Supreme Court put a block on the idea of a citizenship question. Recent years have seen the creation of a number of memorials to the camps. This is the Japanese American Memorial to Patriotism during World War II, which opened in 2000. It's dedicated to both the 23,000 Japanese Americans who fought for the United States during World War II and to those interned in the camps. Here's another portion of the memorial, which is located just north of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. This is the Japanese Amer uh, American internment memorial in front of the federal building in San Jose, California. This is a detail from the memorial. Uh, the sculptor is Ruth Asaba, who was a camp internee. And finally, uh, this is the Garden of Remembrance at San Francisco State University, which includes boulders representing the 10 War Relocation Authority camps. Uh, the memorial and that structure are actually located on the site of one of the original assembly centers. And with that, uh, I'll end and open things up to questions. I think the best way to ask questions, Joel, would be through, um, for people yeah. to type the Q, uh, you know, there is like a section here for Q&As. Okay. Otherwise, we'll have to unmute absolutely everybody and it may be uh, yeah. difficult. I don't know, Ellen, what do you think? I agree. There's um, at the bottom of your screen, you should find something that says Q&A and you can type in a question. Um, put your looking. cursor down at the bottom of your screen, it should pop up. And, uh, it may be at the top for some people. Oh, yeah, if you are on iPad, it will be at the top. And, uh, yeah. We'll yeah. Um, 
Also, if you really want to ask it by hand, you know, you can uh, raise your hand. You, uh, you can do do that, and you can and that's any raised hands. Anybody have any questions or comments? So I'm thinking about it. I, I have a question, Joel. Sure. So there were those no-no boys, right, that you were yeah. talking about, that they uh, answered no to two questions that, that sort of tested their loyalty towards the United States. I don't remember exactly what questions there were. Yeah. But uh, does that mean that everybody who was interned was asked that question and everybody else said yes, yes? Uh, only, I believe only uh, men of potential draft age, which at that time was 18 to I think 40 or 42, I uh, were asked if that, that question. The questionnaire actually came on the service system letterhead. I see. The question is, um, why did the Japanese immigrate to the U.S. to begin with? Ah, well, uh, for work, primarily, um, which was uh, one of the root cause causes of uh, the resentment, uh, the claim that they were taking jobs away from white Americans. The uh, situation in Japan was very much akin in world Japan <laughs> as in China, but of course the Japanese population was so much smaller that they were... Uh, as a percentage basis, a much smaller uh, percentage of the Asian groups coming uh, to the United States uh, in the 19th century. So when did they come? They came uh, mostly in uh, the last quarter of the 19th century and up until the Gentlemen's Agreement. It should be noted that uh, the Gentlemen's Agreement did not stop uh, immigration entirely. There was a loophole that allowed brides to immigrate to the United States. Yes. So it was essentially a mail order bride system, right. and there were complaints that it was being abused. But as a result of that, uh, that had an effect on the demography because uh, the Issei women in the camps were on average 15 years younger than their Issei husbands. And that had an effect both on uh, the birth rate within the camps, and there were some um, 5,000 births in the camps uh, during the internment period. We have two more questions uh, from Ellen Love. Did Earl Warren, when Chief Justice, express regret over his role in the internment of the Japanese? You know, I don't know. Uh, I didn't come across any mention of that? I think this was one of those things where uh, better left unsaid. Okay. Um, another question. Um, did any of the internees receive a higher reparation amount due to seized property? I have an acquaintance who says her family was compensated for the seizure of several stores that her grandparents owned in San Francisco. I don't think any compensation was done by the government. There may have been, by the federal government, there may have been some civil actions and some actions against local authorities. There were a lot of cases where the, the property was never, the property was never seized per se, although it was in Canada. Uh, what it was was that the government took over as custodian. Uh, if they were, if they were US citizens, if they were Issei and not citizens, all of the property was taken by the alien property custodian, uh, and there would have been no compensation for that, or minimal compensation for that. Okay. And uh, Barbara... Can uh, I ask a question? Barbara Ann says, it was 18 when men served, service. So I think she means uh, it was men in the age of 18 or older. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Hello? Yes, Fred, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't think we can take uh, what was going on here um, out of context. The context was um, the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor. And uh, there was a mention somewhere that I hope the Japanese treat American prisoners the way we, we're treating these Japanese. And frankly, I think, um, you know, under the circumstances of the war, uh, 
you know, I can, I can understand, and, you know, given what the Japanese did, did to Manchuria and other places, you know, all the, um, all the news about how, you know, throughout Asia, uh, how unforgiving and masterful and all that. So I, you know, I, the, the nation had to reflect the mood of the country. And I think there was a reason that, um, that the country wasn't necessarily uh, too pro-Japanese. You know, we're at war with them. And again, I, I go to that uh, um, equivalence. You know, I wish that the Americans were treated as well as the Japanese were treated in the US. And I agree with that. Well, I think you're missing a big point there, Fred. Uh, where were the uh, German American camps? Where were the Italian American camps? This was really a race-based response. And uh, don't forget, you know, we're not talking about uh, Japanese prisoners of war. We're talking about 70,000 American citizens and an additional 50,000 legal residents of the United States, many of whom had been here for many, 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 many years. Uh, and as I noted, no, there was not a single example of Japanese uh, sabotage or spying uh, by Japanese Americans during the war. Uh, I should note that uh, there were uh, Japanese that worked thought reasonably to be potentially disloyal. And uh, they were arrested by uh, the FBI at the start of the war. Uh, a large group of them were what were known as Kibe, which were uh, Nisei, uh, US citizens, who had gone off to Japan for their education. And uh, they essentially had been indoctrinated in Japanese militarism and tradition over there and came back to the United States. Uh, the FBI had been tracking them for several years. And uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, most of them were arrest arrested quite quickly. And they were kept in the separate Department of Justice camps. Uh, there were, not sure the exact number, but somewhere on the order of 30,000 uh, people in those camps, and they were confined with uh, German Americans and Italian Americans who were likewise felt to be potentially disloyal because of their involvement in things like the Silver Shirts and the German American Bund and things to that. So, yeah. leaders of those organizations. Joe, Joe I, I just would like to add that. Uh, we, you know, there are two more questions here waiting for us. Can we okay, just. Sorry. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Paul and Ellen just comment that the United States is a constitution. Yeah. Um, and Janice Chang says, will this presentation be available to see again? My family was interned at the Thule Lake and Manzanar. This has been such an informative presentation. And the answer is we have recorded it and we will, I guess, put a link on our website so that you could watch it again of the North Fork Reform Synagogue website. Steve uh, wants to ask a question. I see a hand raised here. Okay, so we're gonna unmute Steve. Let's see. Unmute, it's, uh, it's actually uh, Susan. And what I, I wanted to say is we studied uh, the Kuramatsu case in law school and it is considered one of the worst decisions in, made in the history of the Supreme Court. Um, primarily, for, I mean, besides from a social and humanitarian point of view, but from a constitutional point of view, it's just the, the decision may have suited the times, unfortunately, but it's totally not constitutional. And, and law school professors in the 1970s certainly made that clear. You know, it, it's interesting that uh, when the cases were appealed at the district court level, um, then the basis, as I mentioned, was the fact that the government had withheld uh, exculpatory information. That, one of the key pieces of that information was uh, something called the Ringling Report, which was prepared by the Office of Naval Intelligence in mid-1941, which had concluded that uh, there was 
virtually zero likelihood of Japanese Americans uh, acting as a fifth column or as agents of Japan should war break out. Uh, that report was edited to a very, very large degree uh, and its, its conclusions essentially negated when it was submitted by the government. But in the, uh, some years later, the original draft version of that report was found and that was used as evidence um, in the retrying of the cases. Okay, if there are no more questions, we want to thank Joel again. This was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. And as Ellen said, we're going to put the link on the, of the, the, the presentation on our website. As soon as I figure out how to do it. <laughs> yes, as soon as she figures. And, and I'd like to thank Ellen for, for you know, being uh, our IT support here whenever we, we have these Zoom meetings. And this was actually our first Zoom webinar, so it was a little bit different. And we all had to sort of learn how to, um, how to do this. And, and, and thank you to all the participants and attendees. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this program. And uh, we'll come back for more. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thank Ellen, you. Now, I'm gonna... Joel, any parting thoughts? No. Well, just that uh, just people know, I mean, I... The format, I found the format for the Zoom meeting uh, actually kind of helpful. Although I like doing these in person, uh, I found that it goes much faster in the Zoom format. And so I was able to get more material in, in the hour. I came up with something I want to add this morning and uh, Sandy convinced me not to do it. Uh, there's so many aspects of this story uh, and I really only just touched on a few of them. Yeah, well, this is almost a forgotten story of the World War II in, uh, in the context of other stories that we hear about. This, this was fascinating. Thank you very much. And we got a thank you from Ellen Love and another one from Stephanie Bogart. So thank you. We, and thank, you. Linda. thank you for doing this. This is really enlightening. 30 people on. And there, wait, there's another one popped up. Sarah. Zaram also says thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're gonna end. Okay, Joe. Alrighty. Okay. Take care. Right. Bye -bye. Right. Oh, there's another que there's one more question. I don't want to oh, there's just a uh, it's thanks. just a, a thanks, thanks from Fred Cohen. Right. Oh. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Right.